Boy, oh boy, after that uh, song, I'm just going to read my text. Uh, I was going to tell you the story I left out this morning. That will have to remain untold for a while, really, because this fits. We'll, we'll get it said. It's a good story. It illustrates God's wonderful blessings to us. But, oh, my. Do, do you, surely you do realize what you just sang. Uh, Joshua's marvelous words, Joshua 24, 15. If I would have said it, I would have said, Ekin mehes on Saul the Eredin. Nobody said a word. That's I and my house. We shall the Lord serve. And I wish I had time even to teach you that in Afrikaans because it's a marvelous song. You'd like that really well. Uh, we need each other. Praying together. Uh, loving together. Laughing. Thing together. See, this is Family Bible Week, and I, and I stood down here. I don't know. I was, I was saying to Jody, I don't know the difference in preaching and teaching. There's, there's a difference in us, <coughs> preachers. And I just decided to get down here on this level here tonight. Number one, I don't really like being so far away anyway. And, and it, it will kind of fit what I'm going to try to do tonight because this really ought to be kind of a class, kind of a workshop. I want you to listen to the Word of God in Genesis chapter 2. If you'd like to turn your Bible to that, Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. At the end of the creation of God, as recorded in the first chapter of Genesis, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So man gave names to all the livestock and the birds and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out a man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this cause a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The neat thing about discovering the character of God is that seven times in the first chapter of Genesis, God looked at what He had made and said, that's neat, that's good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And he ends up the creation on the second day and says, God looked at what he had made on the second day. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Behold, it was good. And the third day, good. Fourth day, fifth, sixth day. And on the seventh day, it says, And God looked at everything he had made. And behold, it was very good. The neat thing to say at marriages and in everything else about God is that God knows what he's doing. Come on, it's so, it's so ludicrous for us to be thinking we can improve on God. And we all try. The non-believers try, and even the believers try to do things better. We're even going to do church better than God designed when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and He knows what it ought to be and how it ought to function. So the Almighty was looking in creation saying, in His almighty mind, what would really, really be good? And taxing the mind of an almighty God. God said, let's do this, let's do that. And then he said, well, you know, man, that's, uh, we're, not, we're not through here. Something he needs. And God, in his last act, puts man to sleep. And we could make all those beautiful things. They're really beautiful about taking a rib and not out of his head, not out of his foot and all the other stuff, but rib close to his breast and uh, under his arm for his protection, all those neat things that he may or may not have had in mind. All we know that he had in mind was what would really be good. And he made woman, and Adam said, wow. No, that's the, that's the Marvin Phillips translation. I bet he did. Wow. God, this is really something. 
And then God gave a law that he repeats in the New Testament. He said, and for this cause a man shall... Can I quote the King James? I'm going to do it. It's my sermon, so I'll do that anyway. But, but the words rhyme. And for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. I want to talk about all three of those things just briefly before we go further. Leave and cleave. Uh, it is so important. We're going to call this a love triangle that works tonight because we want to include the married and the unmarried and the children of the married and all the rest of us. So we can cover everybody because God's law and marriage and the stuff we're going to be talking about really applies to all of you. I don't want any of you to shut off and say, well, I, I don't need this tonight because I'm not a, in a married couple because uh, these are things that we all need. And one day you may be married or you're children of, of, in, a married, in, a married, in a family, and, and so you're going to need this. But, but we, need, we need to see all these, uh, these wonderful laws of God. God knows what He's doing, can I say again. And, and He said, for this cause a man shall leave father and mother. And I'm going to tell you, that's extremely important to marry. I'm going to tell you how you're old enough to get married is when you're ready to leave father and mother. None of this stuff of, hey, Mom and Dad, we'll move in the living room back here. We'll rearrange the furniture. And there isn't any house in the world big enough for two families. Let me tell you that right now. And I have lived with my daughter and her husband and their three kids for four months while their other house was being built. And it was so delightful that at the end of the four months when they moved away, we all shed a whole bunch of tears. But having even said that, it's not right. But they're not talking... He's not talking about proximity. He's not talking about distance at all. He's talking about priority. And there's so many marriages in trouble today because this man does not make this woman the number one person in his life. Above his mama. Above his uh, anything else. His cat, his dog, his money, his golf clubs, or whatever it might be. He's ready to get married when that person becomes the number one person on the earth. And, and the same thing for the man. He becomes the number one man. She becomes the number one woman in all the earth. I like to say it at uh, marriages when I perform the ceremony. I like to say to this guy, John, there are approximately six billion people in the world, three billion of them women. And uh, Mary, he has said, of all the women there are in the world, you, you're the one that I want. I mean, just start thinking, he couldn't have had all those three billion women, you know that, but it's still nice to say, because of all of them there are in the world, you are the person. I was kind of honored this morning when, when the Jody was talking about all those millions of people that go to church on Sunday, and you're the only place that gets to hear Marvin Phillips. That sounded nice, all right? A little silly, but nice, you understand? <clears throat> but it's still silly, but nice that he has said in all of this courtship, in all of the stuff that went on, Mary, you're the John, you're the one, and so you've got to leave father and mother, which means that there is no other person on the earth for you in, uh, in priority. She's the number one ma woman, you're the number one man. And then secondly, it says cleave, and I like that. I do, uh, I do one lesson in a Building Marriages the last series called uh, Learning to Speak the Beautiful Language of Sex, and there's a lot of cleaving. And you do a lot of cleaving before hanging on, clinging, and on. I remember the mushy stuff when that ugly guy, and they're all ugly when they come after your daughters, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> Could I hear an amen? All right, so we will, we'll go on with this, you know. But, you know, he, he's coming over here and hugging and cleaving to my daughter, and so he finally works up the courage, and he says, look, I want to take her with me. I thought he was coming to see me. But he says, I want to take her and go because I got what I want and now and I'm gone, you see. But it means more than cleaving, more than the physical, which is so important. So important. i got to tell you about the physical right here. I just slip off into that one because I like giving that one real well. But it's amazing to me how this guy's all over this woman. I can't keep my hands off of you. I just cannot do it. And kiss and hug all the time. And see him ten years later, he say, bye, baby. Mwah! And he doesn't get within six feet of that woman walking out the door, you know. I said to the people in Africa, they're a little different over there. And I said, listen, listen, let me tell you what you do with a woman. You, you, say, to your woman some, you say to your wife sometimes, honey, what's wrong? She said, nothing. Ain't nothing wrong. You know, you're, ah, who can understand a woman? I don't know what to do. And I say, you know, the one thing you can always do to a woman, anytime you don't understand and it's really pathetic and you're really hard uh, where you are, you just take her in your arms and just hold her. Try a one-minute hug. That's a long time. Time it. You know, get on the watch. Hey, love you, babe. One, two, three, you know. And I'm going to promise you that, that in one minute's time, serious, in one minute, you try this. That's your homework for tonight. 
In one minute's time, there's going to be a big sigh as you let all the world out. And uh, you're just standing there holding on. And pretty soon, some silly something like, Honey, I'm really glad God gave you to me. And she said, Yeah, you know, yeah, amen, ditto. Uh, you know, I'm glad He gave you to me. And lie a little bit. The Lord will forgive you. And But you hang on there for about a minute. That's good stuff. And a lot of the guys came back and said, Oh, man. And the women especially said, Oh, I appreciate the homework assignment. Now, the other one was similar, all this, all this kissing. And that was, I said, when's the last time you ever kissed for ten seconds? That is a short length of time. So you lock one on, okay, and look at the watch again. It's nice, you got to, what do you think that luminous dial is for? <laughs> one, two, three, you know. The kids are loving this, and they're saying, oh, I'm glad he's not my dad, you know. <laughs> Telling all about this. You know, just stay there. Just Enjoy. I'm not talking about some of the sexual frenzy, though that's really, that's really fine and good. But I'm talking about just getting close, holding on, and kissing the one that made the number one person in your life. And stay there a while and enjoy. Leave and cleave. And then God said, and these two shall be one flesh. Let me tell you something really beautiful about one flesh. God doesn't call in the Bible anything on earth one flesh except the union between a man and a woman who choose to marry each other. The Bible never says you're one flesh with your parents. It doesn't say you're one flesh with the children, mothers that grow inside your body and you give birth to. The Bible never calls it. It's a marvelous, beautiful relationship, but it never calls it one flesh. It reserves that for husband and wife to be one flesh. God makes it one at the wedding, and husband and wife have got to keep it that way. Now, men, you work really hard to get that woman to say, I do. Work a little bit to get her to be glad she said, I do, you know. It won't accidentally stay. I I hate to tell you, it won't accidentally stay one flesh. Some of it becomes one mess. Sometimes it becomes one boxing rink. Sometimes it becomes one war zone. But it's a lot like buying a new car. It isn't going to stay new. We get married and read in the books, and they live happily ever after. They didn't. That's a lie. They had kids and colic and medicines and all kind of things to go through, you understand? And so it's not going to, it's like buying a new car. It's not going to stay that way. I never was bad on cars, but I never really took care of them until the last, I'm thinking, you know, you're getting close to the end of your life here, you ought to really start taking care of things. And so the last car I bought, you know, I've had all kind of things go wrong. I've paid. I kept records for all. I was paying $200 a month on this car for, you know, in repairs all the time. And I decided with the last one that I bought, listen, I'm going to do this one by the book. I'm going to find somebody I can trust, a mechanic I can trust, and I'm taking that dude in every 3,000 miles and tell him, you do anything this vehicle needs. Can I tell you that is the greatest automobile or pickup truck is what it is. Bucky is what it is in Australia. So if you've got a pickup truck, it's a bucky over there, all right? But that is one good pickup. And, and I have people all the time saying, oh, man, is that for sale? Do you want All I've done is take care of that. Now, your wife will be the same thing if you learn how to take care of her and make her glad that she said, I do. Zig Ziglar talks about, you, men, you made the sale, now service the account. I mean, that's what, he, that's what he's talking about. All right, so we've got to explain the triangle. We're talking about a love triangle that works. And really, I, I, I give this for marriage. And I say this in marriage ceremonies, but it applies to the kids, and it applies to the church. And we say that marriage is one big triangle. Now, it, it is a lot of bad connotation to a triangle. I mean, he marries her, she marries him, then a third party enters the picture, and you've got separation, divorce, you've got, you got killing, you've got, you got nervous breakdown, you've got alimony, you've got everything because of the love triangle. But we're talking tonight about one that works. And the one that works is for at the base angle you put this man and this wife, and God is at the top. So that just like in any triangle, when, when you've got a, a point here and a point here, and they approach the top, it is impossible for them to approach the top without getting closer to each other. Could I ask, without you raising your hands, how many of you would like to be closer to your mate? How many of you would like to be closer to your kids? How many of you would like to have a church where we're all closer to one another? Well, the triangle is it. If we can just put God at the top. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you do that. 
You put you as a husband, you as a wife, and what you want to do is rather than go through all of these formulas that I'm not against, all of the, the high-tech stuff that we've got today, I'm for all of that stuff except to say to you, listen to me, God has some real simple and workable things, and His aren't theories or possibilities. His are laws. And there is no way that you cannot make it if you get the triangle in its place. And the triangle is when a husband says, look, I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here. And you say, okay, girl, uh, I need to understand you and we need to work out our differences. Well, work out your distance between you and God. And it is a foregone conclusion when you do that the closer men, women, that you get to God, the closer you're going to be to one another. I, I see all these young single people and I remember the night that I quit making rules for my kids. Now, you're going to, you're going to get to pay you back. It's wonderful. You go through all this pain of raising your kids, and then they get married and you watch them. It's a riot, okay? Going through what you went through, you know. But that's what it takes. I remember the night when my kids were saying, Dad, you know, come on, this is, uh, this is too hard, and then, and you got to get a haircut once a month. Come on, Dad, wait on, you know. And you're going through all that stuff, and you're trying to be a good parent, you know. I remember one night, and I said, hold it. You know why we parents make these rules? We are afraid you're going to go out and get drunk and get pregnant. We're going to, yes, we are. We're afraid of all of it. We don't want it to happen, and we're praying and working and making all kind of mistakes. Can I ask you three questions I said to my boys that night? Tammy was a little young for this. And I said, tell me that you're going to let God's Word decide every issue. They said, oh, Dad, we believe the Bible's the Word of God. I said, well, that's great. Tell me that you're going to serve Jesus all your life. Oh, Dad, we've made up our mind. We're baptized into Christ. We're going to be Christians as long as we live. And I said, tell me that you have made up your mind you're going to heaven. And my two boys said, Dad, we're going to heaven. And I said, okay. And I gulped and said, all the rules are gone. Now, I didn't mean I was going to leave the premises, but it meant there that I'm through saying, no, you'll be in tonight at this time because I say so because of this. Because, you see, if you get kids to that point where they're saying, all I want to be, oh, I'm having, I had such a wonderful time the last month with this grandson of mine. Because at 20 years of age, you've got this marvelous relationship. We go to Africa together, and he says to me, uh, Papa, at the end of the day, no matter what time it is, we're going to pray together, okay? Oh, man. You get a relationship like that. He says, hey, they want to go to a movie. It's 11.30 at night. I said, okay, hey, he's 20 years old. He was 19 at the time. Do your thing. Do anything you want to. And I forgot all about that. Went to sleep like any old dude would do. Do not say amen at the wrong time. He came back in at 1.30 and shook me. Papa, are you asleep? No, I'm not asleep. I'm just laying around. <clears throat> he said, we haven't prayed yet. Man, I stuff the pillows against the wall and get up there, you know, and we sit down on the two little single beds there and start praying together. Boy, that's magic stuff. you see, he's made up his mind. He wants to serve God. Now, when you get your kids to the point, uh, and you get your marriage to the point, let's back up to marriage a little bit. And, and all this man wants is not this stuff about my wife doesn't understand me and all these problems that go on. All he wants is passion in the triangle is, oh God, I want you I want to be the man you want me to be. And a woman is praying the same thing. Oh, God, make me the woman that I ought to be. And they're fervent in it and they're sincere. Change me in any way. I just want to be the woman. Listen, any man or any woman that does that, the marriage is going to make it. I'm going to promise you that. I'm not giving any guilt trip to any of you that have not made it. My divorce people back at, in Tulsa back me 100% because they're saying, boy, if I had done or they had done that, then we wouldn't be in the trouble we are today. It's a, it's a law of God. It works and we've got to realize that it does that it does work. Well, okay, uh, what does this mean to put God at the top? Number one, here's what it means. It means to make God sovereign. The difficulty with those words <clears throat> is He's the Almighty. He's the King of Kings. Is that we don't use that terminology in America. We're we're di we're we're democratic. And we vote this guy in, don't like him, vote him out, vote another guy in. And we get so big for our American britches until we don't understand sovereignty anymore. Now, here's sovereignty in Galatians 2 and verse 20 where, where, where the Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified. Jesus was crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Yet it is no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself on me. We knock on Paul's forehead. Paul, are you in there? And he says back, Paul moved out, Jesus Christ moved in. That's what it means to put God as sovereign. 
It means that you know He's Lord. And we sing these beautiful songs, these praise songs about that, and then don't do it. But that's what it means to put Him at the top, to subject your will to Him in everything. Now, can we say this about the way trends are going today? We talk so much today about situational ethics, and we talk about uh, postmodernism and all, all these terms that, I, that I, are there, and we're going to have to deal with them. But what somebody ought to come around with is when we're talking homosexuality, we're talking about sex before marriage, we're talking about AIDS, we're talking about anything, we ask the question, what does my God want? What does His book say? And we're going to be surprised when we get to there, His book says a lot about every subject. I don't really like the bumper sticker that says, God, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't really like that. It's kind of in your face, but it's true. It really is true. We ought to get around to that. So it means to submit to His sovereignty. It means that we, uh, that we give ourselves over to Him. In Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, when it talks about it, you understand what your baptism was? Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. He was raised again the third day. That's what you did. Are you listening? That's what, here's His death, His burial, His resurrection. And your death and your burial and your resurrection. You died to self and sin. And to signify that, you were buried under the waters of baptism like these three were today. And they are gone. And their desires are totally different. They moved out of a control room of their life. And Jesus moved in. And from then on, He's Lord. He is Lord. Now, that's what it means. How do you get Jesus there? That's another reason why I didn't go into that little story tonight. Because my next verse there was Joshua twenty four fifteen. As for me and my house. It is a choice. I teach a lot about attitude. And attitude's choice. Did you know that confidence and self-esteem is a choice? One of the things going on among young people today is low self-esteem. And there's no way you can have low self-esteem if you read the Bible and understand what it says. Because God knows all of your faults and He thinks you're worth dying for. He thinks, you know, He thinks you're valuable. And so you can make a choice. I'm going to... You see, the confidence and, and, self, and, and high self-esteem is not a matter of things happening to your courses or books you've read. It's an idea of knowing who you are and making a choice as for me and my house. Now, in marriage, putting him there is a choice. The little end of it, the easy end is, all it takes is two. Any two people in the world who marry and do this triangle thing, they're going to serve God. Now, I, I'm not for going to the Old Testament way of getting married. But you need to remember, don't you, that all of them, all of those weddings were arranged. How would you like that? Abraham says, uh, servant, go off, because Isaac here needs a wife. Go get him one. I love to think about that. Isaac's out there working in the field, and the servant comes back and says, Isaac, come here and see what I got you. I mean, she's covered all over him with slits in her eyes. I mean, you talk about getting something all wrapped up, and you don't know what you're getting. I mean, he didn't say, well, what do you know? That's pretty good. And you would say, well, I tell you what, though, they didn't have love, and they didn't really have emotion and affection and passion in those days. Oh, let's talk about Jacob. And the Bible says in Genesis twenty nine twenty, and he worked seven years to get his wife, Rachel, and get this, and they seemed unto him but a few days. Oh, you want to melt and run down all over the floor, right? I mean, that's the kind of love in the movies Steven Spielberg or whoever it is cannot duplicate because it was a decision. And can we say today that marriage is not so much who you pick, it is, it is who the person is that is picked. You marry somebody that really loves the Lord and says, i got one deep passion in my life, and that is to serve Jesus as long as I live. If they make it and keep it, your marriage is going to work if you do. So the little end of it is all it takes is two. The big end is, oh, dear heart, it does take two. And what a tragedy in God's church today to see women and men who love God so much and would cut their arm off or anything God says to be who God wants. But all of their efforts cannot make that mate do the same. Well, Marvin, what hope is there for them? None. None at all. Tragedy is going to wait to people that do that. So, number one, how do you get them there? But I'm going to tell you what, somebody's going to be at the top. I want to read you a verse. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16... Is that thing that I think Bob Dylan did in that song. Romans chapter, let me get over there. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, where the Bible says uh, this. Don't you know? Romans 6, 16. Don't you know that <clears throat> when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are the slaves to the one you obey. Somebody's going to be on top. Can I ask you who's on top in your life? And you say, oh, the Lord Jesus is on top. Let me see your checkbook. 
Let me see your day timer. Tell me about the books you've bought, the movies you've gone to see, and I'll find out, like anybody can, of who's in charge of your life. In 1 Corinthians 4.20, it says the thing, we're fools for Christ, you know. I remember hearing about a guy, that's a good, that's a good thing. We're fools for Christ. And the guy that had the sandwich boards, one in front, one in back, advertising, and it said on the front of the board, I'm a fool for Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.24, and he says, oh, this is really good. And as he passes by, the back, the back one reads, whose fool are you? And everybody, Patsy Klein. You can't even remember Patsy Klein. We can. Oh, Patsy. Everybody's somebody's fool. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans 6. Somebody is going to be on the top. All right, how do, you, how do you get him there? If it isn't God, it's going to be self or Satan or sin or sex. Something's going to be on top. And when you make your decision which one's on top and put it in God, you got your, your, your miles down the road to a happy marriage. Now, how do you keep him there? Let's read another verse. Over in 1 Corinthians, is it 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3 and verse 8 is a really good verse on that one. How do you keep him there? <clears throat> and you've got to make this decision, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So when you make this decision and you're looking toward Jesus and you're working the triangle, the Bible says a spirit of transformation is going to take place. And you keep Him there by being willing to let God have His way in your life. But God will not remodel a house He doesn't own. I moved to Tulsa and we uh, moved in a rented apartment <clears throat> back in 1970. And then we bought a <clears throat> lot and built a house. And then some, sometime later, somebody knocked on the door and wanted to buy it. We thought, this is great. We'll upgrade. And so we sold the house to them, moved out, and we were in a rented, rented place again. And in a rented house, you can't drive a nail into the wall. The agreement says so. He can take you to court. We can't change a color or anything because it doesn't belong to us. And we built this house that we live in now. And if I want the walls black, jacks are going to be black. It's my house. And Jesus will remodel your house only. If you give it to Him. So Jesus is not going to remodel a house that He does not own. All right. Uh, how do you keep Him there? Is to, is to make that decision. Do something every day to move toward God. There's the triangle. Put it up on the wall. However you want to. And ask yourself the question, what can I do today? This is an everyday thing. You say, boy, that sounds kind of hard. Kind of like eating every day. I kind of like that. Exercising every day. You know, so do something every day to approach God a little better with thoughts, with prayers, with reading and discussions and ask each other the question. Husband to wife, uh, parent to children, ask the question, are we closer to God this year than we were last year? That's a good question. Uh, another good one would be ask on a scale of one to ten, ten being really close to God. How close do you feel our marriage is to God? How close are we to each other? Ask each other, engage this thing, and talk about it and pray about it on a regular basis. Do not say, she doesn't understand me. Do not say, I got my rights. Do not say, look what you made me do. Do not say, you don't treat me right. But things to do would be recommit to the process regularly. And next, pray daily. God, make me the person I ought to be. Let me, let's turn to the, the verse. The verse is Luke 6 and verse 38. This is a terrific thing. Got to tell you a story. That big ugly guy that came and got my daughter, <clears throat> who incidentally was recently one of our elders in the, in the church in Tulsa, Luke 6 and verse 36. Uh, yeah, right down there at the bottom. Uh, he called me one time. Well, no, 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 no. Let's back up. That's wrong. Uh, after we did the thing and he wanted to get married to my daughter. And it was, at a foregone conclusion, they're going to get married. So I called Dale. He's six foot three. I called him up and said, Dale, I want to have lunch with you. It scared him to death. I was really glad, by the way. And I said, I want to have lunch with you. Well, I didn't know how that bothered him. And so we sat down to lunch, <clears throat> and Dale said, uh, okay, what do you want to talk to me about? And, and truthfully, I said to him, nothing. I, I don't have anything in mind. I said, Tammy has been, I've been the number one man in my daughter's life for these 20-some-odd years. And you are becoming the number one man in her life. You are taking my place, and I want to know the man who becomes the number one man in my daughter's life. And when he finally realized that's really all I had in mind, I want to get close to this guy. 
I want to be the best friend he's got. I've been the best friend Tammy had, and now we're going to, you know, be close together. Well, we talked a little while, and he said, well, Marvin, <clears throat> I guess you have seen a lot of marriages make it and a lot of marriages not make it. And I said, yeah, I really have. We've got surprises. Some we thought didn't have a chance of losing, lost. Some we didn't have to think a chance to win, won, you know. And he said, well, what makes the difference? And at that meeting, uh, I said, well, you know, there's a lot in the Bible about marriage. And it hit me in that meeting. I've, I've done it to a lot of people, take a little piece of paper and draw this out. I said, well, Dale, the verse about marriage is Luke 6 and verse 38. I mean, that's it. If you want to get it down to one page, one line, one verse, here's what it takes to make it in life. Here's what's going to make you a good salesman. Here's going to, what's going to make you successful as a business person. Here's going to make parent and child relationship good. Here's what's going to make a marriage good. And listen to what the Bible says. Give problem with that verse is the preacher says that and the deacons start passing the collection plates. You'll realize, won't you, that the word money is not in that verse. It is not in that chapter. So let's see what give is and give what. Give and it. Whoa, I lost it here. Give and it will be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, <clears throat> it will be measured to you again. And so we drew out. I got a, nap, got a napkin. I can't say that in Africa. That's a diaper. And so we say serviette. But anyway, I got one of those things out and began to write on it. didn't sound right to write on a, na- on a napkin now to me. But anyway, uh, we did the football anyway. I put Dale over here, and I put Tammy over here. And I said, Dale, and I put Luke 638 in the middle. Here's what's going to make your marriage work. Dale, you're 100% job in that marriage. See, we hear that marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Any marriage that believes that marriage is a 50-50 proposition is going to lose. It is not. It is a 100-100 proposition. The man's 100% duty in that marriage is to study that woman and give her what she needs. And oh, it makes him upset because he says, well, i got needs and i got rights and what about me? See, and God has it all, all down because you're going to get by giving. You've got to become a giver and the Bible says give and it will be given you. So first of all, you've got to understand that your whole job in that marriage is to study that woman and give her what she needs. Now, a lot of people say, well, yeah, if, if, if I put them in different rooms that I ask the women and the men, write down the things that you need because he's got to give these to Buy me a Mercedes, take me to, take me to Hawaii, do this and that, <clears throat> and just let them keep going. And pretty soon you're going to say something like this. No, you know what I really need is I just, I just want to be loved. Uh, I, I need affection. Uh, I need to be told. That I'm I need to feel important to you. I need to understand and be understood. And by the time you're doing all of that, you're already off of one hand and you're already duplicating. It is amazing how simple our needs are. And praise God, every one of those are something anybody in this audience, regardless of your economic responsi- uh, 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 qualities are, regardless of who you are. doesn't have to take any money at all. Give and it will be given you, see. But the job is, okay, I'm going to give and then, and then watch. And it's not checkers we're talking about. It's not chess, my move, your move. You've got to become a giver. And you've got to do that without expecting anything in return. And the, again, all it takes is two. And if you're doing that and the mate is doing this, you see, and it takes communication. Oh, that big one. Because he can't read your mind, women. And you can't read his mind. And men, you can't do that. So we've got to, we've got to communicate. You've got to write down sometime, like tonight, write down three things that would really make me happy if you would just do. I mean, think about it, pray about it, write those things down. And men, take it and do it. And one woman says, well, he doesn't ever tell me he loves me. And I say to the guy, why don't you do it? He, she knows I love her. I told her, you know, when we got married, if I changed my mind, I'll let her know again. You don't tell her you love her to educate the woman. You tell her you love her because the woman says, I need to be told. And that should settle the thing because your job is not you. Your job is her. Her job is you. And the Bible says this. And if you do this, what does the Bible say you're going to get? This is not a theory. This is not a possibility. The Bible says give and it. Now, what's the it? It's anything. You want trouble? Give it. You'll get, you'll get plenty of it back. I'm going to get that woman, you know, and you're going to get God. I'm going to tell you that right now. She will find a million ways to make you pay. But give, I want what I want is love and affection and good things and health and money and success and go to heaven. 
And here's the Bible saying, you give that. And the Bible says you're going to get. And not only give and get, but it's such an investment. If, if they said at a bank, if you will give us $10,000, let me out. I don't have $10,000 to give. But I'll promise you, if they say, now Marvin, if you'll put $10,000 in this bank, we will pay you 1,000% on a regular monthly basis. I'm going to get it. I'm going to talk to 10,000 of you and get a buck. I'm going to promise you. I'm getting the money because this investment is too good. And so the Bible says give and you get back. Not just get back, but good measure. Pressed down. Shaking together. Running over. It's like if this were leaves we were talking about. The only way I can express this is, is you say, here, honey, if this was a real good thing. Here, honey, here is a basket full of leaves. And she says, oh, that's really wonderful. Wait a minute, I've got, got a gift for you. And she runs back and she fills a basket full of leaves. And then she puts her feet in it and tromps it down and puts more in. And she shakes the basket and she puts more in. And she keeps doing that. And when she's done it, and put the last leaf that she can. And leaves running all over the side and brings it back to you. My God says that's what happens when you become a giver. So we need to be asking questions like to each other. Honey, how am I doing meeting your needs? On a scale of 1 to 10. Lady asked me that on television. How do we how do we go about talking about that? And I said, Well, get together some night and just say, Listen, can we talk a few minutes? Honey, how am I doing meeting your needs on a scale of one to ten? She said, Well, maybe a six. And and she says, Honey, how am I doing? You say, Well, you know, three. And then all you do is talk, why did you say a three? And why is it that low? Why did you say a seven? And how can we make each of those numbers higher? And you are talking and praying, and it works. Now, I've got to tell you, we close this thing out. I've got to tell you how it works, because it still works in my wife and my life. We've been married 51 years, and uh, I'm 73 years old, and she uh, was six when I married her. Anyway. <laughs> but you've got to program yourself. Now, here's my program. My program is the dumb doorknob inside our garage that leads to the kitchen. That's my program. I come home. You know, you come home at the end of the day. This is the way we all come. I'm coming home. I've had a rough day, man. I mean, an elders meeting, you know, a few things like that. And I'm coming home, you know, and I don't need to be told the freezer is on the blank and the cat messed on the carpet and the dog, you know, wet on the, whatever, you know. I don't need to hear that because I've had a rough day. Only thing wrong is my wife is saying, man, alive, I've had a rough day. I hope Marvin doesn't come home saying what a rough day he's had. Men do not know what a rough day is. Man's work is from sun to sun. Women's work is never done. Will you understand? The atomic bomb is fixing to go off in our house. You know? And so I come in. And, I, and the garage door flies up, and I drive in there, and I'm, I'm ready to come in this collision, and it's going to be bad. And she is ten feet inside the house. And I put my hand on the doorknob, and I say, oh, yeah, study that woman. Give her what she needs. Okay, I will. Okay. So I open the door and go, this happens. I open the door and go inside. Hi, honey, I'm home. She said, good night. Are you home already? I tell you, I'm not ready. I haven't even started. I haven't started dinner yet. Study that woman. Give her what she needs. Somebody said, she needs a clip in the chops. That's what she needs. <laughs> Probably not. It's time for a one-minute hug. Grab that woman in your arm so that you don't hit her. Your, your mouth is up next to her ear, and that's when you say, Honey, I'm, I am so glad God gave you to me. And I'm so thankful that you're my wife. Lie a little, the Lord will forgive you. And then you say, I'm so glad you haven't started dinner yet. Look, let's go out and do whatever your budget calls for. Now, as I'm leaving and going out and taking her, I've given her what she needs. I mean, she's had a rough day. And she's telling all the neighbors, I have the most wonderful husband. He is so thoughtful and attentive. And I'm saying, I am the man. I am the one doing all this stuff, you know. And I'm giving to her. And because of that, she gives to me. And I'm giving to her. And she's giving to me. And we end up not knowing who's giving so much. We just know that we're getting an awful lot of life's beautiful things. Uh, I need to finish this. That's the verse. Uh, I'm just going to suggest to you and skip a bunch of things here and suggest, why don't we tonight make a decision about the triangle? Because it's so right and so biblical and God means what He says and will do what He promised. So why don't we just, you know, without anything except in our minds, that you and God know that you're doing. Why don't you husbands and wives all over again decide? Husbands, you just decide, okay, I'm going to make it my number one goal in my marriage to be the man God 
wants me to be. And as of tonight, I repent and change and turn to God and going to do better. And then do better. And women, you're going to decide, okay, you know, we've, we've really had it rough and we've not really close and, and, and problems and pride, ah, oh, pride, and all these things getting our way. Okay, but tonight I'm just going to say, okay, okay, I've got nothing against God, so tonight I'll just rededicate my life to the Lord and I'll uh, repent of, uh, of being a person that reacts instead of responds and I'm going to make it my number one goal to be the woman that God uh, wants me to be. And let that flow into all the uh, young people to your brothers and sisters, to your parents and child and all, and we'll just all, as a church, we'll all say, you know, we've had trouble. I mean, we're doing all this mission work. We're doing all this stuff, but we could really improve. All of us can't. <clears throat> Any good thing we can improve. So even in the church, we're going to get that triangle out again. And here I am, and there's God, and here's my brothers and sisters, and as I get closer to God, I'm going to get closer to them. Let's reposition, restructure, and recommit to the love triangle. That really works. Can we pray about that? Heavenly Father, we've been together here talking about these neat things. The neat thing is that it's your way. The neat thing is that it works. The dumb thing is that we don't realize it. So we go struggling off on all kind of things. You don't understand me. Here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm doing this because you did it to me. Look what the devil made me do. All that junk. We'd like to get rid of junk tonight, Father. We'd like to back up our dump trucks and just dump it in the garbage where it belongs and just acknowledge all over again that you're sovereign. You're the top. You're the number one. You're the almighty. You're the boss. You call the shots. And we're not afraid of that because your way is best. And you have our interest at heart. Father, would you take all these families and single parents and children and all of that, would you take it tonight and just stick us back in the triangle and help us to love and serve you that way? We praise you. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.